We have one more speaker this afternoon uh, before we'll regroup together and have all of our afternoon presenters come together for a plenary or panel discussion. And our final speaker this afternoon is Dr. Thomas Wilms, a registered professional biologist, professional agrologist, and instructor at the Natural Resource Technology Department of the Nicola Valley Institute of Technology. Tom will be discussing work on characterization of thermal refuge habitats and habitat use by stream-dwelling juvenile Pacific salmon and steelhead in the Nicola River. This monitoring represents not only a novel and cutting-edge technology to monitor salmon habitat, but is also a key component to understanding and monitoring the effects of climate change in rivers. We're excited Tom is here today to tell us more, and with that, I'll turn to you, Tom, to start your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chrissy. Uh Clarification, I'm still working on the doctor title, so I'll have to, have to pull that one back, but uh, hopefully I'm close. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for having me here today, uh, just uh, in discussing, potentially speaking at this with uh, some of the folks from DFO. Um, I'll maybe note right off the start that um, as far as my, my research, you know, wasn't necessarily intended to uh, inform monitoring. Uh, on restoration projects or for restoration practitioners, but um, hopefully there's like, I think I imagine with the number of people that are, are watching this today that uh, people will have some takeaways and, and might be able to apply uh, some of this research to their own uh, projects. So look forward to um, interacting with anybody in the future. If you uh, pick up on something that's interesting to you, feel free to reach out. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Tom Wilms. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Northern BC. My supervisors, I have co-supervisors actually. Uh, so um, Dr. Uh, Mark Shrimpton at UNBC, as well as Dr. Tom Piper at uh, TRU. Um, Mark is, uh, covers me on sort of the fish side of things and, and uh, uh, Tom is a, an eco-hydrologist. And so uh, good, good coverage on the habitat slash sort of fish side, side of things. So. Um, okay, good. This slide progression is working. Uh, yeah, so I was raised in the Nicola Valley uh, in Merritt, BC. Uh, I'm a professional biologist, professional agrologist. Those are the two professional designations that I hold. Uh, as far as my academic background, um, I attended uh, Lethbridge College and back in 2003, I graduated with a diploma there. Uh, and then I transferred to TRU where I took their natural resource science program. Um, and then I worked for a bunch of years doing uh, restoration and fish habitat compensation uh, type of uh, works as a consultant. Uh, and then I took a job at uh, NVIT, and, which is the Nickel Valley Institute of Technology here in Merritt uh, in 2015 and, um, as, and entered into uh, the master's program at TRU and transferred actually into the uh, PhD program at uh, UNBC in 2018 just to kind of keep the party going. So. Uh, that's that's my bio, kind of in a nutshell. There, this this picture um, is uh, what I call the um, drone-based thermal infrared selfie. So, those of you that are active on social media, it's a hot tip for you. Uh, you might want to try one of those out. Okay, so I'll talk about the Nicola uh, setting, and I just want to say thanks to um, to Casey and Carolyn for their presentations. Uh, I know that like uh, my mind was spinning the whole time as as you guys are presenting in ways that uh, your projects and presentations were applicable in the Nicola. And so I look forward to collaborating with both of you in the future. Um, lots of really good stuff there. Uh, so the Nicola watershed is within the traditional territories of the Atlakatmuk and Silk peoples. Um, it's about 7,200 square kilometers in, in size and has a main stem stream length of about 190 kilometers. Uh, it's climatically diverse. So uh, the Western portions of our watershed uh, drain uh, the coast and Cascades Mountains. And so we do tend to get a lot of those uh, climates that are indicative of coastal types of ecosystems in the West, uh, in some of those major tributaries like the Coldwater River and Spias Creek. Uh, and then sort of in the Northern and Eastern portions of our watershed, um, it's we're under like a semi-arid type of uh, climate, more similar to the Okanagan uh, related to uh, Casey and Carolyn's um, project areas. I've got snow dominated flow regime here in with a question mark because um, historically I would say that the Nicola watershed is, is, is very much uh, snow dominated in terms of its annual hydrograph, uh, typically having a, a peak flows in, in late April uh, through May, but uh, and then not really having a, 
uh, much of a fall flooding type of season like you get in coastal environments. But uh, that seems to be changing. Um, and uh, if, if those of you that were watching the news on November 15th, 2021, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely see, definitely saw a good example of, of how, um, you know, climate change is, is actually driving changes in our, uh, in the hydrology of these watersheds. Okay, um, temperature sensitive stream. So the Nicola River has uh, historically been classified as a temperature sensitive uh, watershed under the Forest Practices Code. And it is a temperature sensitive uh, system. Uh, it responds very quickly to changes in air temperature um, and kind of lacks, uh, I mean, you know, since, since colonization for sure, um, it, it's, uh, it's, our habitats have been degraded, you know, loss of riparian ecosystems and all the important functions that they have in terms of shade and heat fluxes and stuff like that. So um, the Nicola River does tend to respond very quickly to changes in uh, atmospheric conditions. Uh, fairly diverse fish assemblages as well. Um, so we've got Chinook and, and Coho and Steelhead and, and different populations of each. Uh, quite a bit of diversity actually within those, um, those species uh, as far as uh, runs and populations in the Nicola. We have non-anadromous species as well like uh, bull trout and uh, kokanee and uh, mountain whitefish and yeah and, and lots of other stuff unfortunately recently introduced yellow perch are kind of a big issue that's that we're dealing with in the Nicola so um, yeah so I'll start by just describing my, my study reach here um, and then I'll get into my my research goals. Uh, so my study reach, uh, where I'm looking at uh, thermal refuge habitats for um, juvenile uh, uh, coho and chinook and steelhead in the system, um, includes the Nicola River main stem between its confluence uh, upstream at the Coldwater River, just downstream of Merritt, to Spias Creek, and then um, uh, a small sort of two kilometer section of of stream uh, that has like a riffle pool uh, run morphology downstream of Nickel Lake as well. So I've got those highlighted in red for you there. Okay, so as far as my research goals, I've got three primary um, uh, projects within my research that I'm that I'm working on here um, that are, are fairly diverse, and and so hopefully I can kind of do justice to it in this short amount of time. Um, the first goal was to characterize the extent, distribution, and composition of thermal refuge hab habitats. And we're going to do this by using uh, drone based or remotely piloted aircraft system based uh, thermal infrared imaging. Uh, from there, once we've identified some of these cool water sites, uh, the plan was to go in and install in situ temperature uh, and groundwater upwelling uh, monitoring equipment. So this included uh, temperature tidbits and, um, and uh, piezometers and, and stilling wells and uh, pressure transducers that gave us um, measurements of, of water level and, and temperature as well. And so once we had kind of ca characterized the actual in situ uh, environmental conditions, the idea was to actually apply this to fish and how fish are using these sites. And so we used uh, passive integrated uh, transponder tags, these little RFID pit tags. Uh, we in, in install, inserted them into uh, juvenile salmonids and then um, installed arrays of antennae, which I'll describe coming up and looked at their uh, daily movements uh, horizontally and how they used uh, these refuge habitats uh, in relation to main stem habitats as well. So that's kind of like what I'm gonna talk about here. So we'll start with the thermal infrared piece. So thermal infrared allows researchers the ability to observe patterns of long wave radiation that's emitted from the surfaces of objects. There's all sorts of applications uh, for the use of thermal infrared imagery. Uh, everything from industrial uses to sort of like more obscure research ideas like using it for um, looking at uh, thermal heterogeneity in streams. And so we can look at um, a section of stream where there might be some off-channel habitat and visualize it under a totally different wavelength, uh, which um, exhibits patterns of um, stream temperature. Uh, I'll note that these are, are, um, these are temperatures that are emitted from the surface. And so it does a good job of capturing, uh, you know, temperature heterogeneity uh, on the surface environment, but uh, there are challenges for sure related to what's going on uh, below the surface and the benthic environment. Um, these are some, in, so the last uh, slide was showing uh, a, ortho, or a, a thermal ortho mosaic of a bunch of images stitched together. 
Uh, but most of our research was done just using individual radiometric images. And when I say radiometric, I'm referring to um, each pixel in these thermal infrared images uh, is associated with a relative temperature. And so there's a fairly high degree of accuracy between pixels, but there's another layer of uh, calibration that has to be done to make these uh, uh, relative temperatures absolute and relating them to uh, in situ temperatures. And so we are primarily working within the relative temp temperature realm, just looking for thermal anomalies within a single frame. And you can see some examples here where, we, where we've selected uh, different uh, main stem temperatures and rela related them to some of the different uh, thermal sort of anomalies that we're seeing. Uh, top left hand corner, you can see a, um, a tributary confluence where you can see the mixing of cool tributary water into the main stem. Uh, moving across left to right, we've got some sidewall uh, valley seepage and some spring brooks to the far top right. Um, we've got a, an, an outfall from a beaver dam in the bottom left and uh, some more uh, sort of uh, uh, lateral seepage as well. And then another spring brook on the bottom right there. So just um, different uh, uh, cool water um, originating from different sources, which I'm going to go over here in a second. So what we did is... Uh, it wasn't just a matter of kind of cataloging the location of these and the temperature uh, properties, but actually classifying them into which types of habitats they're associated with. And these come from uh, previous work that had been done, um, which I've referenced here as well. And so this is just sort of a, a modified uh, description of these. So we, we um, categorize them according to seven categories, including uh, cold side channels, which result from uh, seepage of uh, flow from ephem ephemeral channels adjacent to the main stem that are expected to be annually connected uh, to the river at the upstream end. Uh, wall-based channels, this is cool water discharge from channels originating uh, along the base of the valley wall and from terraces that are above the height of the floodplain. We've got tributary confluences like the one I showed previously where you've got a plume of cold water entering the warm main stem of a river. Uh, we've got spring brooks, which are typically associated with uh, low gradient uh, and unconfined floodplains where you've got high water tables that result in uh, the generation of actual channelized flow um, from groundwater across these floodplains, which we picked up a number of. Uh, we have lateral seep where groundwater is discharging along the uh, margin of the channel uh, due to positive hydraulic gradients, um, as well as ver as well as hyperic upwelling, where you actually have uh, visible sort of plumes, uh, a very discrete plumes within the channel that are uh, coming from kind of uh, preferential flow paths. So this is more of that ephemeral. Uh, downwelling, upwelling, infiltration, exfiltration pattern that you see in, in hyperic exchange, as well as cold alcoves, which I'll talk about quite a bit, which were the result of uh, channels shifting laterally and creating new thermal refuge habitats. Okay, so a summary of this uh, portion of the data collection is uh, we collected over 8,000 thermal infrared images. From these, we identified 64 potential thermal refuge habitats. And we, we uh, classified or we designated or specified uh, a thermal refuge habitat as, as one which is uh, greater or equal to two degrees cooler than the main stem uh, temperature. I know that probably there's some fish folks that are uh, questioning this because, uh, you know, even smaller um, uh, differences in temperature can be really, really important to fish. Uh, but it was just a way of sort of like identifying some of those really, uh, pardon the pun, uh, cool sites uh, versus you know, some that were a bit closer. So that's not to discount uh, a lot of the other thermal anomaly, an anomalies, of which there were many. Um, but we, uh, yeah, that was sort of our, our limiting uh, number there. So what we noticed was uh, we actually originally just planned to do this thermal imaging in uh, 2016, just doing one round of it to identify sites. But uh, as it would happen, we had a major flood event, a flood event in the Nicola in 2017, which shifted our channel uh, around all over the place and kind of made it imperative that if we were going to do in situ monitoring that we re uh, fly these um, uh, these sections and, and map the thermal refuge habitat again. And it kind of gave us a cool opportunity to look at changes in thermal uh, refuge habitat composition uh, following a major channel forming flood event. So what we found was that after the 2017 flooding, we actually had a 37% increase in thermal refuge habitats according to this criteria. And we had a significant increase in the number of uh, cold alcove types of thermal refuge habitats. Um, we did a, a dispersion test as well and found that there was no significant clustering of thermal refuge habitats within our study reach. 
uh, using hotspot analysis and GIS as well as an index of dispersion. So I'll kind of show you here what happened. So we've got 27, 2016 count here um, symbolized in, in the black bars, and then we've got 2017 in the lighter gray uh, hashed bars. So you can see that, <coughs> excuse me, total uh, thermal refuge habitats increased in the, after the 2017 flood. And there was some slight shifts in composition in some of the, um, the thermal refuge habitat types. Um, and then actually the, the most surprising result was that uh, this increase, this dramatic increase in the number of cold alcoves, which again, this is where the channel will shift laterally, uh, where the channel evolves, takes a new path, and it often leaves uh, where it doesn't fill the former channel full of sediment. Uh, it'll sometimes leave sort of like, you know, this, the, the abandoned channel below, like its invert elevation below the groundwater cable. And so it will cause groundwater to exfiltrate into that channel, which meets the surface. And then creates this cool water kind of off channel habitat that um, probably a lot of folks are familiar with. And so uh, we had a, like, we had a significant increase in the number of those types of habitats after a flood. So, okay. Uh, so discussion here. So thermal refuge habitats are not static. That was kind of one of the key takeaways uh, and floods may represent an important uh, mechanism in thermal refuge habitat recruitment. Um, and that lateral river movements can create actually new thermal refuge habitats. Uh, this is all kind of in keeping in the concept with shifting habitat mosaics that was introduced uh, you know 20 years ago um, but it's something that we need to remember i think you know in applying this research to restoration and restoration monitoring is that um, as we start to shift to more process-based types of restoration um, uh, like uh, casey was talking about um, we need to consider that uh, you know floods may represent this kind of uh, interesting mechanism in terms of uh, recruiting and, and making new thermal refuge habitats for fish. Okay, so moving on to the in situ monitoring piece. So once we had identified our cool spots, we selected a few that looked really good for installation of monitoring equipment. And so what we did is we used nested uh, piezometer and stilling well combos where we had a, a, a piezometer that had a closed but perforated bottom end, just PVC pipe. And then to that, we attached a stilling well, which is basically just a pipe that's open at both ends, which gives us a measure of river level versus groundwater elevation level. Um, both of the, we installed pressure transducers in these so that we could monitor them continuously as well as monitor temperature. Um, and we, uh, from this, we used a key metric uh, which was vertical hydraulic gradient, which is simply the measure of the head differential divided by the depth um, that the piezometer is installed. Um, and this just gives us a measure of, of the hydraulic head potential there um, of the groundwater. So positive values would indicate the groundwater elevation is higher than the river level and would, we'd assume that water is exfiltrating into the river and vice versa with a, um, a head lower than groundwater head lower than the river level, we might assume that water is going from the river into the ground. But uh, these processes are, are complicated. So. Um, and we examined the changes. We also, one key part of this too was, you know, everybody's dealing with, with flow and how flow affects fish. And there's been some really important um, discoveries recently about this in the Nicola. And um, we wanted to examine how flow affected uh, uh, not only temperature, but vertical hydraulic gradient as well. Okay, so here's this, uh, how we installed them. So we put in a, a, a machine that we had made for us where it's just a drive point and a casing. Uh, and so you drive it into the stream bed, pull out the drive point, install a PVC uh, piezometer that we made, and then remove the sleeve, leaving that in place. And this middle picture, you can see this is, this is exactly what you're hoping for is, is when you put that thing in the stream bed that it flows like an artesian well and, and you know, kind of confirms what you found in your thermal infrared imaging. Um, some interesting takeaways in terms of temperature. So uh, you can see that uh, in terms of these charts. So this is just an example from 2018. Uh, river level uh, or river uh, temperature, average daily river temperatures uh, respond um, uh, to air temperature uh, very closely. Uh, but as we look at these in, in terms of our thermal refuge habitats, so this is stilling well temperature, SW temperature and piezometer temperature. So this represents thermal refuge habitat temperature and groundwater temperature respectively. Uh, there are some differences in terms of sensitivity when you compare that to background temperatures. Uh, some thermal refuge habitats were very, uh, were, were not very sensitive to changes in uh, atmospheric 
temperature and some sort of, uh, you know, uh, were cooler, but, but you could definitely see that response. And then groundwater temperatures, uh, you know, definitely seem to be more, more even, you know, as these temperatures are buffered by the temperature of the earth and kind of what you'd expect there. Uh, so we got into um, uh, kind of modeling this and looking at thermal sensitivity. And this is kind of an example of some of these sites where um, thermal refuge habitat sensitivity was quite variable, um, was most often uh, these sites were less sensitive to changes in, in atmospheric temperature like you would hope or expect. Uh, but definitely like quite a bit of diversity in between sites and then as far as the groundwater temperatures as well um you know being even less sensitive than the um the stilling well temperatures obviously um one thing we found was that those those uh sites that were off channel versus main main stem thermal refuge habitats were uh you know less sensitive to um, changes in atmospheric temperature because they're off channel and you know they don't have the dilution of of main stem water with um this uh, hyperic water Okay, so we modeled, uh, uh, created some models. So our, our sort of most parsimonious model of main stem temperature in terms of predictor variables included uh, air temperature. Air temperature was the main driver of, um, of main stem river temperatures, but we also did see a significant um, response from, uh, from changes in, in average discharge in that uh, changes in discharge actually, uh, positive changes in discharge actually increased our temperature. You know, not, to the, not nearly to the degree uh, as as the air temperature sensitivity, but you know um, was si significant for sure. So, okay. um, another interesting thing that came out of this was when we actually plotted our um, our discharge against our vertical hydraulic gradient, we noticed a pattern, um, particularly in our 2018 data, where the uh, surface water hydrograph had a bunch of pulses of flow in it, which actually ended up uh, producing what appeared to be a, uh, an inverse response in our vertical hydraulic gradient, um, which anyway, uh, created some questions. And uh, I talked to our dam manager about, you know, what or how these flows originated. And we basically got down to that our uh, late August and September pulses were due to dam releases. And then the, the bigger ones you see sort of towards the fall were due to atmospheric events. Um, so we'll kind of talk about that coming up here too. Uh, so what we did is we actually, uh, sort of looking at that relationship, we modeled on some of our most sensitive sites. For instance, this uh, uh, site number two here, where we have a very um, strong vertical hydraulic gradient. There's a huge difference in, in groundwater elevation versus river level, level elevation. You can see uh, kind of the most dramatic responses to changes in flow. And so we modeled these for that site and found that there was actually this, this uh, inverse relationship held true, especially uh, sort of in. Um, changes of up to uh, one cubic meter per second per day in terms of rates of changes. So um, again, yeah, uh, increases in flow um, would result in a corresponding decrease in vertical hydraulic gradient, which, you know, may potentially have effects uh, with respect to thermal refuge habitat uh, and the fish that use them, as well as potentially to main stem river temperatures, but we didn't uh, quite pick up on that. So. Uh, so thermal refuge habitats displayed lower thermal sensitivity compared, this is kind of our, our overview of that component. Uh, thermal refuge habitats displayed lower sensitivity compared to main stem habitats, uh, especially for off channel thermal refuge habitats. Uh, groundwater temperatures were least sensitive to changes in air temperature. Uh, vertical hydraulic gradients were generally positive at thermal refuge habitats, but were quite variable, a lot of variation in between sites. Uh, some thermal refuge habitat sites, uh, at some thermal refuge habitat sites, uh, vertical hydraulic gradient was sensitive to rapid changes in stream discharge. So uh, maybe some potential takeaways there in terms of management of flow and ramping rates under uh, regulated systems. Again, in 2017, there was a far more gradual de uh, decrease in the hydrograph following spring freshet, and we didn't notice these patterns to the same degree. So, Okay, so from there, we're actually going to look at how fish responded to thermal refuge habitats. So we caught fish using backpack electrofishing techniques. We tagged coho, chinook, and steelhead uh, juveniles that were greater than 55 millimeter, uh, millimeters of fork length and uh, ins uh, inserted a 12 millimeter half duplex pit tag into them. Uh, we installed arrays of uh, HDX half duplex multi-readers at the confluences of where our thermal refuge habitats met main stem habitats. 
And we did these in series. So we would do uh, two, sometimes three series of antennae so that we could look at the time signatures uh, and find, uh, determine the direction, the direction of movement uh, between thermal refuge habitats and main stem habitats. So if we had detections of fish going from upstream to downstream, we knew, we'd know that that fish was uh, emigrating into main stem habitats and then vice versa if we had detections at our downstream reader and then upstream uh, they would be moving from main stem to thermal refuge habitat. So we could actually term, determine direction of flow and from there determine when uh, fish were occupying these sites. Okay, so this is an example of one of my setups here. So we've got this simple loop of wire which we use with these HDX systems which goes to a tuner, which allows the reader to uh, read the tag um, of the fish that's moving through uh, these antennae. And so we do them in sequence so we can know the direction. Okay. Um, so here's a summary of our fish capture. So we captured uh, 289 fish in total over our two seasons and tagged 145. This included 43 Chinook, 64 Coho, and uh, 38 Rainbow Trout or Steelhead, depending on, yeah on where they were going to go in their life. Uh, I'll, note, I'll note here too, so, you know, not, not surprisingly, our rainbow kind of had the largest uh, a size. Um, coho were the smallest and Chinook were a little bit bigger than our, our coho, having, you know, emerged earlier and probably are generally a bit bigger. Uh, so what we did there is we looked at our bulk uh, sort of detection frequency. So this is just like when the, the total number of detections we're getting at sites and when. So we plotted these over a 24 hour period. So you can see I've got a frequency histogram here where my bins are, 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 are 24 hour hourly intervals. And uh, immediately you start to note like at site one, three, four, and two, uh, you've got this like pretty apparent bimodal distribution of detection times. Uh, you might be wondering what's going on at site 2S. So site two became site 2S uh, after year one because this was actually the outlet of a beaver pond and as beavers do they engineer their environments and change them and uh, the plume of the thermal refuge or the cool water coming out of the beaver pond actually spilled over another portion of the dam and it was spilling directly into the main stem of the river and so we didn't have like enough space to put in two readers and so we just uh, created a loop of wire and put it right in that plume and so we would Basically, uh, rather than detecting movement between main stem and thermal refuge habitat, we would just detect them when they were in that thermal refuge habitat. So it became more of like a, a detection of occupancy rather than of migration. So you can see that uh, it sort of fills in the gaps between that bimodal distribution. Uh, so immediately the pattern comes, it sort of uh, makes one think, well, why am I seeing this bimodal distribution? Well, it kind of corresponds with uh, sunrise and sunset or some kind of crepuscular activity. And so we uh, sought to sort of look at the um, effects with respect to that. And so what we did is we plotted uh, these detection, or actually what we did first is we looked at our, our directionality data and we, we, uh, we took out the detections we could where we could actually determine that there was a, uh, a, a migration, an immigration or an emigration. And uh, so we, we took our bigger data set and, and, and um, filtered it down into those, uh, or those movements that were actually, we could say were, were um, immigrations or emigrations. And so uh, at some sites, there's quite a bit of like sort of what I call crepuscular activity where there's movement kind of both ways. Um, and then at other sites, depending on the, the physical nature of the habitat, uh, you'd find fish were just like scooting out. Um, so you can see here in blue, we've got immigrations to the main stem or sort of immigrations to thermal refuge habitat. And then we've got emigrations in the salmon color, uh, which are moving from thermal refuge habitat to the main stem habitat. Um, and so you can see that it looks like these fish are kind of like, um, uh, you know, moving out to the main stem to party at night and then coming back to the thermal refuge habitat, uh, you know, in the morning. So we, the next thing was to look at, okay, what is the relationship? Uh, if, if we have this crepuscular activity, what is the relationship? Uh, like assuming that fish are moving in response to temperature, uh, but it's, there appears to be some kind of crepuscular component to it. Uh, how does that line up with uh, actual sunrise and sunset events? And so we looked at that and we found that the detection uh, and migration timings uh, appeared to correspond with 
changes in sunrise and sunset events, uh, events. and hopefully you can kind of see this in this chart. Um, I've got kind of blue un, undifferentiated uh, detection times. You can see site 2S there, um, sort of uh, on the right side, second from the top. Uh, that's where we had that antenna on the site, and you can see that there's a lot of blue dots within uh, sunrise and sunset. And then you can actually see the migration timings parsed out at site three, where you've got these emigrations that correspond with those um, waning uh, sunrise and sunset or waning photo period towards the end of summer and fall. Uh, and and uh, there appears to be a relationship there. So the goal there was from there was to actually model this. So what we um, or actually in, in looking at these, um, the timing of these activities, I was just uh, um, I was struck by just the regularity of responses and how you know you could really like set your watch to <laughs> the movement of some of these fish. And this is just an example of a 70 millimeter um, coho at one of our sites in 2021 where we started um, uh, monitoring our um, this fish's movements uh, on July 30th, and it maintained um, regular migrations. Um, two per day, an emigration uh, at night and an immigration in the morning until we stopped monitoring um, uh, monitoring migration at the site on September 17th. Um, and the other question that came from that was, you know, like temperatures are pretty cool in the main stem in September. So um, maybe these fish aren't moving totally in response to temperature. Maybe it's due to something else. And so like a uh, um, photo period, like we had mentioned. So we developed two models, one to characterize occupancy. So we used a logistic generalized additive model where we've got a, a binary data set with um, uh, records of occupancy versus not occupying ones and zeros. Uh, and then we also modeled, um, we took our detection data and we uh, binned it into, um, uh, into uh, hours and, uh, and temperature integers. So uh, for each temperature, uh, Celsius temperature digit as well as each hour, and we turn that into count data for doing a uh, Poisson a generalized additive model of uh, detection times. So I'll show you those here. Uh, so here you can see uh, our occupancy model uh, on the top on log odds scale and then converted to probability scale uh, on the bottom. Um, uh, um, so we can see that uh, positive. Uh, occupancy is is very distinctly associated with those times in between uh, kind of uh, sunrise and sunset, uh, and then in terms of probabilities, uh, you know, included on the bottom scale there too. And the interesting part here is you can see that main stem temperature is actually a very poor predictor of thermal refuge habitat occupancy, as we would have expected moving into this. And our primary or our, our best um, uh, predictor of occupancy at these thermal refuge habitats was actually uh, photo period. Okay. Uh, then here's that second model that I had talked about where we've got this um, tensor uh, function, this interaction between uh, time and main stem temperature. And you can just see here uh, in terms of the hotspots for uh, detection times uh, being around that sunrise and sunset time. But uh, if you look at sort of the vertical band of this data, you can also see that um, these migrations occurred across a range of main stem temperatures. Um, and seem to be primarily associated with, with photo period. Okay, so here's kind of main discussion here. So thermal, uh, stream thermal heterogeneity is well utilized by juvenile salmonids. Uh, temperature is not the only factor driving these dial horizontal migrations. Um, we did notice as well that at thermal refuge habitats with, that had limited food, we were more likely to see these dial migrations between off channel or thermal refuge habitat and main stems which were likely associated with fish uh, going out to the main stem at night on feeding forays, as has been uh, documented by others. Um, sites that seem to have some trophic resources, uh, fish were less inclined, individuals were uh, less inclined to, to uh, migrate to main stem habitats to feed. Uh, and there's also uh, juvenile salmon uh, also, degrade, also display a high degree of uh, thermal refuge habitat site fidelity. Um, and use these sites like consistently and regularly, as I had shown before, uh, throughout the summer and into the fall. And so um, that was kind of, that's been um, 
studied by others as well, but was really quite a neat observation. Um, as far as overall takeaways here, uh, our, our, our um, remotely piloted aircraft system-based thermal infrared was effective in, in identifying thermal refuge habitats. Thermal refuge habitats uh, were cooler than main stems generally, um, and fish used them. But uh, it seems that these, uh, the, these horizontal migrations uh, between these habitats seem to be driven primarily in terms of uh, the movement by uh, changes in photo period. Um, so although they were using, utilizing cool off-channel habitats when the main stem was you know, extremely hot, uh, the actual um, driver to uh, initiating a migration seemed to be photo period. Um, and, it's, and functioning floodplains and rivers are dynamic. Uh, it's a key part of this uh, idea of shifting habitat mosaics and process-based restoration. And it's important to recognize that floods can actually create habitats as well. Um, so it's my funding sources. And thank you guys very much, uh, all of you that are out there that I can't see. And uh, thanks for the previous presentations as well. Thanks very much, Tom. Really appreciated that presentation and, you know, have my mind reeling with all of the options and opportunities with this kind of methodology. Um, I just wanted to take a moment um, before we go to panel and, and ask you a question. I had a similar one and it's shown up on Slido, so I think I'll, I'll flip to that one for you. And I'm wondering if you can comment on whether or not there are any special considerations for using thermal imaging for restoration project monitoring, and particularly kind of under this, um, this idea that you've um, told us about where the mosaics are shifting. So can you give any advice for how that might impact um, restoration project monitoring or planning? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if the goal is, you know, like in these semi-arid systems where there's temperature sen sensitivity issues, uh, I think thermal refuge or sorry, uh, uh, thermal infrared imaging provides like just this really handy, pretty inexpensive now, uh, and rapid tool for identifying uh, potential sites. Um, then in terms of actually uh, monitoring, you know, uh, like what are the, what are the key metrics in terms of like, let's say process-based restoration where we wanna let a river be a river and have like major flood pulses and to wiggle around, um, you know, what does that do to the thermal heterogeneity of, the, um, of these stream environments? Uh, kind of the main caveat that I'll note is that, um, you know, it is only capturing surface um, surface temperatures. And so there's a lot that's going on beneath the surface. You know, I, I did a little bit of snorkel uh, surveying pr uh, prior to actually doing the fish component of this work. And uh, I had my, I got my uh, wetsuit on, which I really didn't need because it was hot, but I, I <laughs> that was a learning. And then I had my flippers and I was ready to go and quickly realized that flippers aren't all that useful in six inches of water. But so I had to kind of drag myself around looking for fish using these off-channel habitats. And what I was finding is, uh, as I was moving my hands across the, the stream bed, these uh, upwellings were very discreet. Like it's not a diffuse plume. It's like literally my right hand would be freezing cold and my left hand would be warm. And so um, that's something that, these, that this type of technique doesn't work very well for. And so there are some other techniques, but I would love to see uh, sort of better methods for characterizing what's happening on the bottom of a stream where fish typically hang out. So. Uh, hopefully that's a fair enough answer. Great. Yeah, thank you, Tom. That's a good clarification and, and good mental imagery of how dynamic and discrete the, these thermal uh, differences can be.